I'm going to start by saying something that I think is obvious, uh, but I also feel it needs to be said, which is that uh, the internet is a mirror. It's not inherently democratic. It's not inherently inclu inclusive. The only thing it is inherently is reflective. And what it reflects in Russia is first and foremost a very fragmented society, a society in which public space and public conversation and all the basic components of political culture have been destroyed. So when we get a reflection of that, what we get is a bunch of discrete nodes that are not interconnected. They don't look like any of the networks that you've seen on screen today. Um, and that, um, that look, uh, you know, that, that often you look at, some, at a node and you realize there's no way to get there from here, which is just like Russian society. Uh, and what those unconnected no nodes can do is they can create bursts of activity, but they can't create sustained activity. They can't create sustained connection. They can't, cre uh, they can't create sustained communication. They're, still, it's, they're better at creating bursts than any communication tool that we've had before. You know, they're a lot better than some of that just because they're faster uh, and they're much bigger in scale. Um, but what, what, it, what they cannot do is provide an alternative narrative to the one that we're living in. Right, um, and um, uh, they can't also give answers to questions that you haven't asked. Uh, and in that way, they're actually worse than some communication tools that we've had in the past. They're worse, for example, than uh, American funded and Western European funded radio stations that we used to have in Soviet times. Because you would tune into a radio station, you would get information that you hadn't asked for. You don't get that anymore. You get exactly what you want to, to hear. Another thing that the Russian internet reflects is a society uh, that, for very good reasons, has extreme mistrust, right? A society in which nobody trusts anybody else. Anything you, you do will be used against you. And we saw that just over the last couple of days. We're about to see, uh, I mean, there's a new law uh, that was signed by Putin just a couple of days ago and uh, there was a series of searches in opposition leaders' apartments yesterday. There were about 15 searches. There was a series of interrogations today. And what we're about to see is a series of prosecutions uh, of, organ of protest organizers based where some of the evidence will be based on stuff that they've actually posted online. Um, so uh, now I'll go into some very specific stuff about, uh, about how it works. Um, Unlike China, Russia doesn't block entire websites. You know, you don't, we have access to Facebook, we have access to Google Docs, which I just discovered being in China that, you, uh, that China doesn't. Um, but um, internet providers are obligated by law, and this law has been on the books actually for longer than Putin has been in power. They're obligated by law to maintain uh, uh, very expensive equipment <laughs> that records absolutely everything that goes on. And they're required by law to turn those records over to security agencies um, on request, right? Not on court order, on request. Uh, and uh, so, uh, another thing that's important is that uh, it is illegal to use encryption, the key to which has not been handed over to the security agencies. So, um, there have been, uh, sometimes we found ways around it. I was very lucky, for example, that uh, Skype had not gone, over, uh, gone along with this provision while I was writing my book about Putin. I'm not sure I would have been able to finish it uh, had that not been the case because I had conversation with my editor, conversations with my editors. I sent documents on Skype. I did everything um, on Skype. Now Skype has complied with this particular provision and actually uh, I think it's safe to say that there's no unmonitored, uh, unsecure uh, 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 means of communication that is available to internet users in Russia. Um, and that again, that's, that's, that's a very reflective thing. It's a very accurate reflection of what we have elsewhere. Uh, we have permanent direct surveillance of opposition activists. Um, I have found bugs in my apartment and at, uh, at my country house. I have been told uh, and threatened uh, with the fact that there, there are video cameras in my apartment. I haven't seen them, but people have threatened to post footage shot in my home online. 
Uh, I will not at all be surprised if that happens. It has happened to other people. It's happened to a lot of people. Um, people find them, uh, have uh, conversations in restaurants and find recordings of those conversations online the next day. We've had um, internet dumps of uh, hours upon hours upon conversations between opposition leaders. Um, people have talked on the phone uh, about planning to do something like uh, uh, recently somebody arranged to, um, to have something read during a television show. Uh, right, a note from uh, somebody who was banned from television arranged to pass a note to somebody who was willing to read it out loud on air. Uh, that, uh, that, that arrangement was made by phone a couple of hours before the television show. The person who made the arrangement who had not been blacklisted on television was taken off the show after that conversation. Right. So um, then there's the internet-based abuse uh, and intimidation. And the way it works is um, uh, there are DDoS attacks on opposition and independent media sites, and these are uh, separate things. But for example, today there was a, there was a huge protest in Moscow. And um, uh, whenever, the, whenever we have a large protest, uh, there are uh, DDoS attacks on all the independent media uh, and uh, independent websites that, it, uh, that succeed in bringing them down at least for the duration of the protest. You would think that makes no sense, right? That everybody who's interested in the protest is at the, at the protest. But in fact, it's, it's a pretty smart strategy because um, of course there are lots of people who can't go. There are people in other cities who need to know whether actually there are a lot of people out in the street in Moscow, whether it's uh, uh, 17,000 people like the police said today or more than 100,000 people like we observed today. And you can tell the difference between 17,000 people and uh, 100,000 people if you're watching live coverage um, on web-based television or elsewhere. Uh, well, you don't, you don't get to see that. Now, uh, again, you would think that that's pointless because they can post that footage uh, later when the, when, this, when the website or the, um, or the television is not under attack. But remember what I said earlier about lack of sustained activity. You have bursts. So they actually do lose uh, their entire audience for the, for, uh, for the duration of the protest. By the time the detox attack is over, say tonight, there will be a, a drop in interest. People will not see what happened in Moscow today. Um, there are things that happen to um, our Facebook pages. Uh, and of course, you know, Facebook, page, uh, Facebook has been um, an incredibly important tool. In fact, in some ways, it's been the only tool because any attempt to create a domestically hosted website has failed. There is no way we can have um, enough servers to withstand sustained DDoS attacks uh, on domestically based sites. So uh, there, there have been a couple of attempts and, and, and it's, uh, they've, they've all been disastrous. So we use Facebook. Facebook is not a good organizing tool, which may be a surprise to some of you. Uh, it's great to or for organizing a wedding party. It's really not great for uh, organizing uh, a demonstration when you need to be inviting tens of thousands of people. Uh, because I've personally been suspended by Facebook a couple of times uh, for issuing too many invitations. I've also been suspended by Facebook uh, because there, was uh, there were too many of memes. Because of course the best way to, um, to discredit uh, somebody who's active in the opposition or I should call it the, uh, the protest movement, is to create um, doppelgangers. So um, when, I was, when I thought I was smart in reporting uh, pages that claimed to be me, that weren't me, or that were using my photograph, um, I got suspended because, <laughs> because, I, uh, because I had to prove that I was me. Fortunately, I was able to prove it, uh, but not right away. Um, and, um, um, and then there's, uh, there are bot attacks on the, uh, on the actual Facebook pages. So a couple of days before a protest occurs, um, what happens is that uh, every 30 seconds, and I, I should track this because I've had to actually spend days sitting at my computer along with many other people uh, trying to delete these messages. So every 30 seconds, an in, uh, India-based generally user uh, registers on the Facebook page and then immediately posts something ridiculous or absurd, but not abusive. 
on the Facebook page. Um, it's actually, if it's done every 30 seconds, you can't keep up with it. You cannot uh, uh, delete these postings and ban these people fast enough, even if, the, uh, if, if you're using eight or 10 hands to, to do it. Um, and also you get sus uh, your administrator privileges suspended uh, because you're, de uh, you're deleting too many people. So that's a good way of, of, uh, of freezing protest activity. Uh, and they, they've done it every time before, before protests, so about 24, 48 hours, uh, just when the maximum number of people is logging on to see whether other people are going, whether, whether it's going to be 500 people or 5,000 people or 20,000 people uh, or 500,000 people, uh, just, just when people are checking in and trying to find out what's going on, that's when the fixture gets completely obscured. Um, and um, like I said, you can't, you can't really fight this thing effectively. Uh, what has happened as a result was th is that uh, while Facebook was hugely important at the beginning of the protest movement, it's become less and less accurate. And it's become less and less accurate uh, a reflection both for uh, uh, occasional participants in protests who, uh, who just want to, to go online and see even what, what, uh, whether they should be joining a protest, what's actually going to be happening there, how many people are going to be there. It's also, and this to me is more important, has become a less and less uh, reliable and accurate tool for the protest organizers. Uh, and that has uh, uh, direct practical consequences. For example, we organized a, uh, a march on May 6th. This was the first uh, large demonstration after a short lull in protest activity. And it was incredibly disappointing uh, that there were only about 5,000 people uh, who d indicated on the Facebook page that they were going to go to the protest. So in our negotiations with the police, we had to tell them how many people were going to be at the protest. Uh, we you know, thought, okay, 5,000 people are planning to go. It's probably not exactly accurate, although in the past we, we've had 35 and 50,000 people uh, saying that, uh, that they're going to go. It's probably not very accurate, so we should tell them it's going to be 10,000, uh, so that we have a little bit of, 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 of leeway. Well, about 100,000 people showed up on May 6th. And uh, the practical consequence of that was that they could not get through a bottleneck created by police, partly on the basis of faulty information that we had supplied. I mean, the police were also, they had violated an agreement that we had had uh, about the route of the march, but still, there was this, um, this issue of uh, our having supplied faulty information, and the protest ended in a bloodbath. And it ended in a bloodbath because of the bottleneck. Um, there's also another practical consequence, which is that if you, in Russia, you have to get a permit <coughs> to hold a demonstration. The permit is issued for, particular, for a particular time period and for, for, for a particular number of people. If you exceed the number of people, uh, as an organizer, uh, then you're liable to be fined. As of June 8th, the fine is $9,000. Right. And the organizers aren't just the people who applied for the permit, but anybody whom the authorities believe to be an organizer based on their online activity. So here you have this catch-22. Um, again, today there was, there was a march in Moscow. The permit was for 50,000 people. We think there were more like 100,000. We're not going to say there were more than 100, uh, uh, more like 100,000. So this is the first time that the organizers have been uh, roped into participating in the government's lie. The police said there were 17,000 and, and the organizers said 50,000, um, which, is, which is the number of people that the permit was for. Um, but actually all you have to do is look at their aerial, aerial photos, which do exist. Uh, and you can with some accuracy estimate the number of people there and there were more than 100,000 people there. And that means that any one of the organizers uh, is likely to, uh, the, or is, it can possibly be prosecuted and fined $9,000. Uh, there was another thing that I just want to mention that doesn't really have to do with online activity, but that happened today, which is that one of the organizers uh, was served with a warrant on stage at the rally. Quite effective, too bad, you know, all the media were under details attacks and uh, people, people saw it, but it was, it, was, it was really quite spectacular. So, um, 
what, what happens now is that basically organizing has to go offline. Uh, and uh, again, our experience has shown that Facebook is not a bad way, but not a great way of sort of bridging online and offline activity. Uh, but really, uh, the other, other internet-based tools are worse. Like Twitter has turned out to be completely ineffective in, in, uh, in bridging that uh, online offline activity. It's great for broadcasting, but it's, it's very bad at getting people to do stuff, like do stuff right now offline, come to a place, go to a meeting, call in and say you're, uh, you're willing to distribute literature, that sort of thing. So, um, and, um, and I think that the internet will speed up the offline organizing Again, going back to what I said about, uh, about it being faster uh, and it being b bigger in scale than tools that we had before uh, when all we had was Summers that uh, 30, 40 years ago. But in essence, it's not that different because the society is not that different. 